Kalimera, Kalispera, Kalinichta. No matter where in this wild, wacky, and sometimes wonderful world you might be, don't let them kill the joy. It's a new week. It's a blank canvas. Let's paint pictures and let's tell football stories. It was a big one this weekend, and I've got some big guests to help me talk about it. Let's rock and roll, people. Mind the gap between the train and the platform. Please stand clear of the discussion doors. The next stop is Highbury Squad. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the Highbury Squad once again. Um, Super Kev will be back soon. Don't you worry about it. I have two amazing guests joining me to talk about the weekend's action. For those listening on replay, it's not our usual hour, um, but thank you for joining us and those listening on our audio platforms too. Appreciate you as well. In studio with me today, uh, one of your favorites is back, uh, ex in Town Manager, Mr. Paul Buckle in the house. Welcome, Paul. Got to see the Kev, the Kev welcome. And of course, looking as happy as ever. Speaking of don't kill the joy, welcome <laughs> back to Squad Central. Liverpool legend turning up the day after yesterday. Mr. Stevie Nicholl deserves a massive round of applause. Hey, there you go. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, just want to start by saying at ease, squaddies at ease. I lose my manners with manners when Super Kev isn't here. Welcome to all of you in live chat. All the usual suspects are here. Let's get stuck in, shall we? Can we start with the joy thing, Stevie? I know the boys on the SPNFC give you a real hard time, you and Craig, about joy. Um, but you played the game, Paul played the game, you both managed, which is why tonight's show is called the Player Manager Edition. A little note to Jamie from myself um, and some other Arsenal fans. Can we please talk about the joy of winning and this nonsense, Stevie, about over-celebrating? What is that? <laughs> Who said uh, over-celebrating is nonsense? Um, well, we think it's well over celebrating. Well, Jamie Carragher said that we need to be more disciplined and get down the tunnel, and then Gary Neville said that we really need to be a bit more mature um, about this right. whole thing. So, no, I don't, uh, right. I, don't, I didn't hear that. To be honest, once the game's finished, um, I, I, I don't have a problem. You know, I, I've seen some of the pictures with Odegaard, you know, with his camera. Um, it's a big game, and you've just won a big game. It's not like it's not like the old days when you just get off the field. Uh, everybody now, regardless of what tier of football you play, and everybody's waving to the crowd and cuddling each other and and all the rest of it. So that's just you've just got to accept that you know. In the same way that you can't tackle anybody today, uh, you got to accept that today <laughs> when the game finishes, then ev everybody's going to overly express how they feel and you've just got to take it on the chin when, when you're on the other side of it. However, I think doing it during the game, I have a problem with. So I think after the game, I, I accept what it is, but I, I don't like it during the game. When you say during the game, like what, managers going at it or players goading, like the op the opposing fans, stuff like that? Well, I think, I think, I think yesterday you've got Arteta... Sprinting left, right, and centre. Um, you know, Klopp. Klopp has done similar things in the past. You know, when he, I can't remember who it was against, but when he, I thought, oh no, it was Everton in the derby. When he, you know, when he ran, on the, when he <laughs> ran on the field, he's cuddling Allison. You know that that's not acceptable. And 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 Paul and I haven't been on on the bench, standing in the dugout. You know, when you're standing in the dugout, you've got to remember and you've got to respect the guy on the other side. Because we've all been on both sides of it. We've all had the times when we get the goal and we've all had the times when, when we lose the goal. And so you have to remember that. You can't, you can't be going and, and, and running all over the place and running on the field. and It's disrespectful to the manager sitting next to you. I, I, I've always felt that. Uh, and as I said, I'm not, I'm not just having to go at Arteta. Klopp's done it previously. Um, and I, don't, I, just, I just don't think it's respectful at all. Paul, 
We've seen the Mourinho slide. We've seen the Klopp celebration, the one Stevie mentioned in the Merseyside derby going and piling on Allison. There's no doubt after the third goal, Mikel Arteta, I think, almost went around the entire Emirates Stadium. Um, I kind of agree with Stevie here. During the game, these dart celebrations have come back to haunt players of late. I always worried about when Saka did this, you know, in the Man United game. I don't like that type of stuff, but you've been on the sidelines. What would you be saying to your team after? Fair or foul that they celebrated or do you want them in the tunnel like Jamie Carragher said? Or should I say Killjoy said? Well, I, I agree with, with Steve as well. You know, as a manager, um, you know, you've got to be very careful if you start going over that line of celebration because it will come back to bite you normally. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to control your emotions. I think there is a line. I didn't like what the Brentford players did. I've had it straight as they did that celebration. I was like, oh, no. What are you doing that for? <laughs> you know, why it spurs... And don't need to antagonise them. You don't need to do anything at all. And sure enough, that came back. You know, Madison made sure, didn't he? You know, that they knew that. And you saw Madison, what he did when he came back, because there's that, just that line of respect. And I just, I just think some things you don't need to do. I think after the game was fine. I didn't see a problem with that. And I thought Ian Wright explained it very well. And you can look at both sides of it. You can say, well, is it over-celebration or, you know, should they should they just get themselves into the dressing room? I didn't see anything wrong with that, you know, and Ian Wright said about that photographer's been at Arsenal for years and years and years and Odegaard took that moment. But I think that's decent. I think when you're in your technical area, and I've had it done to me, uh, I swear to you in, in in you know, not at this level obviously, but professional level and four hundred games, I've never ever thought about has to going into his area or doing anything to antagonise him from any of that. But I've had it, I had it in a final once, in a playoff final. Coach, assistant coach, come and jumped right across me. Literally, he jumped area on the goal. Um, but I, I managed to... Yeah, I was raging after, absolutely fuming after, but... Yeah, you've got you've got to take control and you've got to always have respect. Carragher on the phone there. He's heard already, giving us a buzz to let us know he doesn't really appreciate anything that we've been saying uh, so far. Um, OK, celebration police done. Let's talk about the game. Stevie, I feel like this is going to be one of those moments for a few people where they talk more about what Liverpool didn't do versus what Arsenal did do. Liverpool have been the darlings in the media of late and, of course, the loving for Klopp with his announcement that he's leaving the club. Um, do you think, take me into the mind of the manager a little bit here, do you think it's best to make those kind of announcements at the end of the season, as long as the club knows so they can plan forward for it, your players know? Do you think that was, in hindsight, a good idea? I'm not saying just because they've lost this game, it's not a good idea. But as a manager, um, and even as a player, would you have liked to have heard that news at this juncture of the season? Let's start there. Well, I think in an ideal world, yes. Um, you wait to the end of the season. But my understanding is is that you know he told them in November of, of how he felt and what his plans were going to be. And the reason that he came out was because they found out it was going to... Somehow it had gotten out. And of course, the way the way it ended up coming out is way better than just waking up in the morning and all of a sudden it's all over the papers. So my understanding is it's not it's it wasn't Klopp's idea, it wasn't the club's idea to let this be known so early. Uh, it actually was because of a leak, and they found out that it was going to be in the newspapers, and so they just decided to to, to announce it. So that's. That's my understanding of how that actually came out now. But I would I would say it's not ideal that, that, that it comes out. Um, so, yeah, that's that, that's what happened. Paul, would you have done it this way or would you have just let it roll? You in agreement with Stevie on this one real quick? Uh, well, I think the leak's a problem to start with because I would imagine it was high level, Steve, right? He'd have been talking to the execs. Right. I think, I think that's a prop that can be a problem, you know, because it's forced you, it's forced your hand. Uh, I think Klopp's ha handled it brilliantly, uh, really well. I think 
the Liverpool players look like they're in a really good place. I, I you know, I don't think yesterday has anything to do with that. But it's just it's not ideal. And I you would prefer to to leave it to the end of the season, absolutely. You know, especially the season they're having, because you don't because the first thing that's going to happen if if Liverpool derail in any way, people will look at that, you know. But yeah. I had a, I had, look, I had sort of a, a similar one with Luton when uh, Rebecca had been approached to come to the United States in 2013. It was in the middle of the in the middle of the season, and and the, I went straight to Gary Sweet and told him, and the club wanted me to stay on to the end of the season, but my circumstances were like you're emigrating, you're going to America. I had a lot of things to sort out, my children and different stuff. So I had to put family first there and leave. Which wasn't ideal. That that wasn't ideal, but it was one of those. It was one of those things. But this this certainly isn't ideal. But I do think mm. they've got a top top manager that can navigate around it. So let's talk about the football, um, Stevie. We've mm. talked a lot on this show, and you and I, we, we your first conversation about the Arsenal and Liverpool was about ten years ago. And you know, we've both been in the wilderness a little bit. But Liverpool, of course, have pulled off some incredible wins um, the Champions League, of course, uh, in Turkey, um, do some domestic trophies. We've been really successful in the FA Cup, less so uh, in the Premier League, and really for a number of years just were happy, content finishing in the top four. A lot of our listeners and fans hate us being compared to the journey of Liverpool under Klopp, but I liken it, and I actually like the comparison um, we've gone from process to progress, I think, over last year to now where I believe we should be success. How much does the win yesterday and in the manner in which we won change Arsenal's narrative for you? I don't, I don't think it changes the narrative. It just, it just tells you what most sensible football people knew, that Arsenal are a contender. You know, the the Christmas they had, the period they just had, made everybody question, and rightly so. When when you have the, the type of run that they, they've had, then you deserve to be questioned, and you're going to be questioned. But what they did in beating Liverpool was answer the question. Are they good enough to go on and win the Premier League? And if they're going to win the Premier League by beating teams like Liverpool then you can't say anything other than absolutely what you're talking about is progress. So, yeah, no, they, they just confirmed that they are title contenders. But as I said, most normal, sensible football people understood that they were still in contention. Uh, and, of course, they're sitting two points behind Liverpool. Obviously, City two games in hand. Uh, they win the two games, they go top. Um, but right now, it's a three-horse race. So you can't argue with that. That's that's a fact. So the fact is, you've gone from the Wenger years through that period you were talking about, and Man United are going through it right now. As you said, Liverpool are going through it. And who's to say that in the coming years we're not going to go through it when Klopp leaves because his whole staff's gone. You know, whoever comes in, it'll be a completely. It could be a completely different way of playing. That that that. that that opens a can of worms to how does the next guy play? Where does that leave our Trent Alexander-Arnold because of the way he plays the game? So, so, so many questions. But to get back to your to your point, uh, Arsenal just proved in this game that they are title contenders, uh, and you can't say anything other than than that's huge progress from when uh, Arsene Wenger left. Sorry. Uh, Paul, there's the argument that in order for Arsenal's respect to totally come back, um, this Arsenal 2.0, this new culture, DNA profile under Mikel Arteta and Adu, that, you know, almost qualifying for the Champions League, getting pipped to the boast by Tottenham, that was still a good season, but it didn't end fruitfully for us. Uh, last season, the improbable run to the to the title didn't end well for us. Uh, and here we are at this point where that progress is continuing. Would you say that our respect won't come full circle until we win the Premier League? I think so. <clears throat> I agree with Steve, you know, sensible football people, but the game's not so sensible anymore, as we know now, with everything you know, highlighted under the lens. And I think Arsenal, they don't want the tag of blowing it. 
I mean, it was thrown at them last season. If they'd have lost yesterday, and they could have, um, eight points would have been a big ask. That would have been a huge ask. You know, three games, Liverpool to lose and them to gain points to, to overturn that. So it was huge. And the way they did it, they ticked a lot of boxes. Um, Steve would know as, as a manager um, how difficult at times when you've dominated a, a half and you, you're about to have a team talk and that's completely changed in an instant that you didn't see coming. That's not tactical. It's just an error. And it's got your opponent right back in the game. I think Arsenal, I'd love to have known what, what Mikel Arteta said at half-time because uh, it's a, you know not long. You don't get long half-time. But to, to calm them down, to regroup, because Liverpool kicked at the start of the second half. Liverpool, it looked like they had that, that lift. And Arsenal sort of contained mm-hmm. it, went on to, to win a massive game, showed a load of different qualities and skill sets as a team. And I think that, yeah, in answer to your question, they... We'll need to win the title to, you know, to really, to really then go and try and sustain that success. You know, I think that's the key. When if they can win that title, then, you know, the pressure will come off. You know, I was going to ask you guys about the uh, dressing room uh, because we did totally dominate that first half. There were a couple of moments. Um, oh, however, oh, oh, hold on, let me take in so I, yeah. I've heard this from a lot of people saying that. That that Arsenal totally dominated the the first half. I think we got to understand that it's, it depends on what your definition of dominate means. You know, my definition of dominate would be Liverpool against Chelsea during the week. That would be my that that's mm. my understanding of the word dominate. I don't I don't think you can say Arsenal dominated the game. The way they went about the game was spot on. They sat back. Basically, the, the, the line of confrontation was pretty much the halfway line. Van Dyke, you and Kanati can have the ball all day long if you want. But whenever you get near the halfway line, that's when we, that's when our team is going to close the ball down and win it back, which is what you did, which absolutely tactically was spot on. Um and that's how you won the game. You know, the problems you've had so far this season are because teams have been sitting deep, you haven't been able to break them down. But what you did against Liverpool was you had a, a line of confrontation and that was it. And you're not getting through. And Jorginho and uh, and Rice were, were absolutely... had their hands and their feet all over that. They were absolutely fantastic. I think it helped that that you're playing against Slobber's lie. Uh, sorry, I think it helps that you're playing against Gravenberg and Gakpo, and not slow as Lion Nunes. I think that helped as well. But the fact is that in the middle of the park, you completely snuffed out anything Liverpool had to offer. And then when you did that, you used the pace of Martinelli, the pace of Saka, the brains of Odegaard. Unfortunately, you've got Havertz up front. That's unfortunate for you. But that's how you won the game. So, again, it depends on, on, on your definition of demonstrate. There's no argument that at half time I'm scratching my head going, how is this 1-1? Because every time you went forward, you looked as though you were going to create something uh, and certainly thought you'd score more goals. So, as I said, that that was my definition of the game. I don't think dominates the right word. I mean, you look at the stats. What, what, what would your word? Controlled? Uh, PW says here, controlled absolutely. the game for you? Absolutely. I think that's perfect. They, they controlled... They were in control of their destiny, basically, you know, because they, they knew that they, they would sit tight, give Liverpool nothing, and then use the pace, which you haven't always been able to do because of the way some of the opposition have played against you. That's when you're at your best, with some space to run into uh, and able to get to get matchups in the wide areas, particularly with Martinelli, you know. You know, I guess I'm sure I've heard it all week is saying, the first thing we need to do is look for Martinelli against Alexander Arnold because Alexander Arnold can't defend. So yeah, I think I think control is the is the absolute word. No question, the best team won on the day. Um, but I think it was helped the fact that Gravenberg and Gakpo were playing and and, and not Slobber's Lie and Nunez. You know, I really have an issue sometimes with 
in the post game um, where it's if who wasn't Salah wasn't playing and Sobajlai wasn't playing. Okay, well Jesus wasn't playing, Zinchenko wasn't playing for a whole half, and Thomas Partey hasn't been available pretty much all season. Um, Paul, would you agree with Stevie's assessment? Because it's fifteen shots to ten. For, in favour of Arsenal, seven, seven on target for Arsenal, one for Liverpool. The possession, I think, is where you feel the rubber meets the road because the possession doesn't speak to what your eye test saw. It's 58% to Liverpool, 42 But, of course, towards the end of the game, we allowed Liverpool to have more of of the ball. Um, do you see it the same the same way? Is it because our midfield dominated so greatly that it it, it feels like maybe there wasn't as much action around parts of that in the first half or enough good finishing, say, for him to suggest that we didn't dominate? Yeah, I think Steve, he's, he's summed it up really well. I think control is the word as well. And I think Liverpool would have been disappointed with that because I was expecting more from Liverpool. You know, I, I really was. And they struggled. I think Arsenal got it right. With the ball, they were brave. They, they didn't go away from playing their style. But against the ball... Yeah. Um, that confrontation line, it was very organised. And when they went, they jumped and then they and they cut right through Liverpool. Uh, I think the outsides were a massive part of the game for Arsenal. As Steve said, you know, that Trent Alexander, he can't really go one for one. Um, and that's a problem at the highest, highest level because if you start doubling up, I think Martinelli was good enough to shift it to the middle and then out. And now you've got Saka and you've got overloads. And I think that's a big part of Arsenal's game keeping those two wide, but they're both intelligent enough to know when they're doubled up to come back and go the other way. Um, so, yeah, I think that's mm. that's potentially a problem for Liverpool um, against the top, the top teams. Steve would know that, you know, the 1v1 duels, you've you've almost got to go there and do that. If your centre-backs are having to come out, or your midfield shifting across to protect you because you're not going tight. Um, that does leave space. And with the, with Rice being that anchor, Rice shifts the ball, you know, one and two touch can really cause you problems. But they did control the game, Arsenal. They did. They absolutely controlled it. There was a lot of intent. Um, I thought Liverpool looked dangerous in spells. We just was waiting for Liverpool to get going because they've scored a, a lot of goals of late, but you didn't really see that. So I suppose that's if you keep Liverpool quiet right now, I suppose people could see it as, as domination, but I see more control. Uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about players who helped with that control. And I wanted to tap into your player manager minds here because something I don't get in modern football, and I know we live in an instant gratification world, Stevie, you alluded to that just a little bit ago, is how one player could be in a Ballon d'Or race or could have scored a gazillion goals and won a Champions League and play six months in Saudi Arabia, for example, and be crap overnight in someone like Benzema. And someone like Jorginho, who, um, well, Benzema won the Ballon d'Or, but then someone like Jorginho, who wins the Euros, dominates England, is up for a Ballon d'Or um, and has the type of skill set that he does and I said on our show last week, I don't think Jorginho has been given a fair shake at the Arsenal and that comes with the Chelsea stigma. Can you, Stevie, talk me through a little bit, a player like Jorginho who works in the shadows mostly um, but can control a game and if Arteta may have missed a beat with this missing link in midfield, with the Partey injury, with you know, maybe things not have gone to plan yet. We're still up there this season. It's the style of football that we're playing, more possession-based. How does someone like Jorginho get poo-pooed and puts in a performance like this and then gets recognised? I just, I don't get how fans turn on players so quickly um, <laughs> when they've done one thing just, you know, a year a year prior. Well, it's, it's, it's ultimately professionalism, you know, because when you don't play... You, the coach has to rely on you making sure that you're looking after yourself so that when something happens or a game comes along where your specific skill set is needed, because that's what we're talking about. Mm. You know, I, I spoke earlier about, you know, generally Arsenal are playing on the front foot, teams are sitting back and they're defending. So Jorginho's not really what you need. That's, that's the bottom line. 
But the fact is that the skill sets that Jorginho has, the, the ability, the professionalism, the, you know, as much as he's not playing all the time, what a great guy to have around the building and, in, and on the training field and 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 giving a, an example to young players of how to do it, what to do, when not to do it. He's probably talking to them all the time on the field when they're training. He's probably he's probably a big part of the dressing room. So it's a smart move to, to have Jorginho. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people just look at, well, who's playing and who's not? And if you're not mm. playing, not everybody's part of the Sour Grapes gang when they're not playing. You know, that's when you have the wrong culture at a club, that's what you get. You get older players who have been at the top, maybe aren't at their best anymore and can't play week in and week out. And sometimes they join the Sour Grapes gang and it screws the whole club up. But when you get people like Jorginho, who all the things I've just thrown in, and you know that in certain games, you can put him in there and you know that he's 100% fit. You know that he's looked after himself. You know what he's capable of. That's 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 the the real that's the real professional. And and you mm. talk about these guys got Saudi Saudi Arabia. That's what happens when you play for money. Not, the reality is most play, most players want to get paid a lot of money, but actually play because they love playing football. There are players who will go and play for money, but. When you do that, that desire disappears. And that's what you're seeing in Saudi Arabia, in my opinion. And players who went there thinking it was a good idea and then coming back, like Liverpool's own um, Jordan Henderson, probably realising that he made a, a big mistake. It's, just, it's, it won, it's true. Like football's, I hope football grows everywhere in the world. But, you know, there might be some spots in the world that aren't quite ready for, you, for, ready for it yet for a variety of reasons. Paul... Jorginho is someone that made the team tick. He was player of the match yesterday. Um, seemed to create this comfortable partnership again when playing with Declan Rice. Very, very seamless. Um, I wanted to talk to you about another player that kind of comes into the mix. And again, I think everyone expects him to be something that he's not. And I, and I feel like he's probably one of the most misunderstood players in world football let alone um, the Premier the Premier League, and that's Kai Havertz. I think everyone expects him to be this goal-scoring machine um, that is a wizard and a, and a pizzazz player and a game-changer every single time. Um, but he w what really wasn't that at Chelsea. We obviously saw the best of him at, at, at his old club in Germany, where he, com he was a, a shining star. Talk to me about Havertz a little bit because yesterday I thought he did all of the dirty work and didn't complain about it, never complains about it. Um, is that kind of rough? I'm not going to say Giroud, but we've all been talking about a plan B up front a little, a little bit, someone who gives you a little bit more strength, um, a little bit you know, more shithousery, which I think he has it in him. Is Kai Havertz a misunderstood player or, or has what some Arsenal fans believe to be true has Mikel Arteta blown sixty-five million on him? Where do you stand with Havertz? Well, Mikel Arteta would have obviously done his homework and seen stuff in the player that he that, that he needs in his team. Getting the balance right in a team is really important, you know. And sometimes from the outside, people can't understand why you play a player. I'm sure Steve again would have had this. You know, it compliments others, it frees others up. I mean, I'm not so sure that he does that much dirty work, if I'm honest. I mean, I, I think that's a gimme sometimes anyway as a player, you know. Um, but certainly as a striker, you've got to be scoring goals and making goals, I think, at that level for that price tag. And I think that's where he's falling short. Um, yeah, I think that the, the pressure's on when you're on the, you know, you, you sign for that much money to, to a top club, Arsenal. There's a big expectation that comes with that now you know, with the fans, the media, everything. And sometimes the body language can be can play a part. You know, some players I've worked with, you know, they really care, but sometimes their body language doesn't suggest that or give that out. And I think he can be a little bit guilty of that. You know, like he doesn't sometimes look up for it. I'm not saying he's, that, that, that he's not, but sometimes he looks that way. And that can be frustrating um, for fans to see. But um, certainly going back to what Steve said was fascinating to listen to, it reminded me of, you know, when you've when you're trying to man manage and you know, you go on any court of the courses, they'll tell you about man management and 
managing our pub, managing the players is very difficult when you've got a big squad and players want to play. But having a Jorginho that, that, that does it right, that comes in, uh, McTominay's showing that for me at the moment, to be honest. I know he's younger, but he's showing me that, McTominay. You know, you never know what he's thinking. He just comes on and does the business, scores goals, he's been making goals. Um, and he sort of takes it out, whatever frustration he's got, I feel he takes it out on the field, on the opponent. And, you know, you can never target him for being unprofessional. And, you know, managers look at that. You know, that's the first thing. It's so easy when you, you know, for, for players to sulk. And I agree with Steve, you can get a little group that, um, you know, becomes sour and bitter and it really can go against you as a as a manager. So it um, doesn't matter what level it is, those players like Jorginho are worth their weight in gold. Stevie, is Havertz um, madly underrated, like Shady says here? I think to be underrated, I mean, what has he done to make, for anybody to think it, that he's not? I mean... Is he under? Is he under? I, I guess when you score the he's winning he's goal not... in a Champions League final, everyone expects you to kind of be the Ronaldo, you know, Gareth Bale. I'm going to score in a final and win every. Well, you Divock, know. Divock, Divock scored a goal in the Champions League final, but do you want him at Arsenal? <laughs> I don't think so. So you know, that's kind of a. It's, a lot of people use that, but it's it's absolutely the wrong thing to to be using because we're talking about one game. <laughs> so, listen, Sophie. You, I bet you've had one game in your whole life that you were brilliant. That doesn't that doesn't mean you should be playing for Arsenal, ladies, does it? I'm usually brilliant on so. the shows that we do together, and yeah, ESPN <laughs> haven't come calling yeah. yet. So there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you can take over from Parkinson then. He's he's uh, decided he's had it all. So. Um, but no, um, in, in all seriousness, yeah. with Havertz, I don't I, I don't think he's helped him any. You know, you, you, everybody, he, he was bought from Chelsea as a striker to score goals. He didn't score goals. And and when you don't score goals, you better be assisting, as Paul just said. And he wasn't doing that. So then Ateta's, Ateta didn't bring him to play him centre forward. Ateta brought him to play from the middle and get him in the box, is what he did. And to pay £65 million, on a on a gamble and and on something that you saw but nobody else thinks he can do, and then when it actually you put him on the field and say right who's going to be right and who's going to be wrong here, because the proof's always in the pudding. I like that one, and <laughs> the truth is is that ha- uh, he hasn't been able to do it from the middle of the park, getting forward and putting the ball in the net. And mm-hmm. so again, it comes to a situation where he's just is injured against Liverpool. And then it works out because Havers is a guy who likes to drop in. And so that means that you get even more bodies in and around the, the, the Liverpool midfield. And then you once you get it, everything opens up and you get after them. So I don't think he's I don't think he's underrated. I think he's rated exactly where he is. He is not a top class striker. Uh he's a good football player, he's got a good football brain, but he's you know, I, I if he was if he was for sale tomorrow, none of the top sides are buying him are looking to buy him. I I would agree with that. Unfortunately, I would say that I would say that yes, I would agree with that. Unless, of course, he scores the winning goal in the Champions League final at the end of the season for the Arsenal pool, then then you're talking about other teams coming in for him. Um, I want to get back to the manager a little bit. Um, and the process progress to success. He's made some pretty big decisions this season that a few of us have thrown our toys out the pram about, um, me included. And oftentimes, in that managerial role, when you have a vision, Paul, and you can see exactly what it is you want to do, but nobody else really can, that feels like a pretty lonely place, especially when you're not winning, but you know the results are going to come. As long as your players believe in what you're trying to do, do you give a rat's ass what anyone else around you is saying? Because it feels like that's 
where Mikel was during the process and a little bit of the progress? Yeah, well, I, I think Pep went through that, didn't he, as well? I remember, I remember going to watch Man City against Celtic a few years back and Man City were all over the place and John Stones was playing in different positions and he was trying loads of stuff and they were losing. And you get pelters. I mean, Steve said, said, you know, you, you, you've got to get it right as a manager. You know, if you, if you start to move players around or you're, you're experimenting or you're doing stuff that people can't quite see, you've, you've got to win. And it comes down to the results. Um, but, you know, between games, you don't have much time. And sometimes you can lose your way. You can lose your way in your thinking. You can become a bit stubborn. Um, sometimes you don't have people around you that will question you. I don't know the, the top, top level, Steve, would know that. But, you know, you do need people around you that can ask you the question, right? And really get to the bottom of it as to what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to do. Um, but, yeah, I think. I think getting that settled team and getting that familiarity in the units, you know, playing with people regularly is is a recipe for success. Um, you know, but yeah, I've, I've certainly um, mixed it up a few times and <laughs> got stung, got stung for it. And the fans, have, especially at Luton at times and clubs, you know, big clubs have expectation. Um, you don't get it right. You leave yourself wide open. Yeah, I can't imagine it's a fun place, Stevie. I mean, from the time where he sent Saliba out on loan to not playing Martinelli to making Zinchenko play the inverted role at Arsenal to signing Kai Havertz to shifting Aaron Ramsdale um, and Raya now being the number one. Of all the decisions that he has made leading to this point, um, would you say he has courage and mostly, Stevie, these decisions have worked out for him to this point? I, I don't know whether courage is the right word. Um, the the race one and the Ramsdale thing for me made absolutely no no sense whatsoever. You know, when when you're making decisions... Probably, you know, one of the words Paul used was stubborn. If you're too stubborn, you can make yourself, you know, people can, people can, you can make yourself look stupid. And, and I guess that's when your staff comes in because you need somebody there to, who knows what you try to do because you've probably talked it through with them. But who, if the manager happens to be a type stubborn, you need somebody who's going to go, right, just, just in my opinion, we're going to we can't keep on keep on doing this, you know. Whilst you're winning games, you can you can get away with holding on to something because ultimately you're winning games, so you can always get away with it. But when you when you're not, and you keep you keep plugging on with something that that clearly isn't working, um, and you keep doing it, then yeah, that's a problem. I think he's got the Havertz one wrong. I think he's got the goalkeeper one wrong. I think you can argue that the best thing they ever did was was put Saliba out and loan because clearly when he came back, he was a better player. And that's that's the whole reason for, for that mm -hmm. loan system. Um, who was the other one you said? Zinchenko in the inverted role. I, I, again, I don't have a problem with that um, because... He may be taking it from Manchester City, but guess what? Man City are absolutely fantastic. So I, I don't think trying to do things that other teams who are so good are doing is a bad thing. And I think Zinchenko, when he's in there with the ball at his feet, does make a difference. He's a little bit Alexander-Arnold. He's not the best defender. Mm. Uh, and, and again, again, it's probably a little bit like the Jorginho situation. You know, do you play Zinchenko... Every Saturday for ninety minutes, probably not. Depends on your opposition. You know, I've had Liverpool, had Salah playing on the weekend. If I'm Arteta, I'm not playing Sinchenko. I'm playing a defender. So I, I don't think he's got the Sinchenko one wrong because he hasn't played him all the time. I think he's picked and choose when he's going to play him. Yes, he's had a couple of injuries as well, um, but. Yeah, but I think I think the mistakes he's again the mis when you're making mistakes, it's always good to make little mistakes. 
But when they're howlers, like I think the Havertz one is sixty-five million. That's 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 a big decision that's gone wrong, and I absolutely still believe that the the Ramsdale Rea thing was absolutely wrong. I don't think mm. Ra, uh, Rea has been any better than Ramsdale whatsoever in goal. Can he ping a ball thirty yards way to the right or left better? Maybe he can, but I tell you what, the guys made particularly early on made a lot of mistakes. Um, and I guess that stubbornness that, that Arteta has is why he never made any changes. And how Ramsdale's still at the club is beyond me. I, I, I find it interesting. I watch Ramsdale on the sideline and he always seems to be behind his team. He's always still shouting. He's, always, he's watching the game. I mean, the majority of players i played, if they were sat on the bench, would be counting the pigeons and the, and the roof, never mind watching the game. But when you see Ramsdale, he's into it. He wants his team to, to win. He wants his players to win. He wants Rhea to make uh, saves. I mean, what a guy he must be in the dressing room. But at the same time, come the end of this season, he's going to have to go right. I might be a good guy, but where's my career? Shouldn't be on the, mm. shouldn't be sat on his backside on the bench. If I'm him, I'm out the door. Now you're going to have to try and bring a goalkeeper in as a number two when you've got a goalkeeper in Rhea who I believe isn't Again, if he's up for sale, none of the big clubs are coming in for him either, I don't believe. And certainly mm. weren't. They weren't before think... Arsenal signed him when he was at, at, at uh, Brentford. So, <clears> yeah. I think I, know, I think Man United will take both of our goalkeepers right now. Maybe Chelsea will take uh, either one of our goalkeepers right now. Well, it depends um... how bad your goal is. <laughs> and by, the way, Man United's, by the way, Man United's not a top team. <laughs> Get that right. Currently. But there's still a big club. There's a difference. This is the this is the mistake a lot of people made about Arsenal when we were, you know, just churning, just clicking, you know, plodding along in the Premier League, mistaking us for not being a successful Premier League club with still being a big club. And I think people are making the same mistake a little bit with Man United now. They're not, they're a big club, they're just not doing big things. Man City, smaller club, doing big things. I think that's the difference. Paul, you wanted to jump in and weigh in on the... <laughs> what a statement that is. I hope, you, I hope your Clip social it. media account is ready for some action. Clip it. A small club it's doing big things. <laughs> yep. And that's what I think. Okay. They're, they're on their road to becoming a big, massive club. Okay. But right you now, say, compared to Man United so. and Liverpool, nah. No, not a chance. Even Arsenal are a bigger club than them. We just we just can't win anything. There's the difference between winning and being a big club. Okay, Paul, <laughs> I'm gonna get I'm gonna get the pelters for that, according to the legend that is Stevie Nichol. But in <laughs> hindsight, now is the Raya decision the right decision for you? Are his decisions should it be commended for some of the decisions that he's made? Well, it goes back to when uh, I look at it when when Pep got rid of um, who did he get rid of the keeper there? Was it Green? Joe, Joe Hart. Oh, sorry, Joe Hart. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, and everyone kicked up. Do you remember there? It was sort of like yeah. you see that coming. And I've spent a lot of time with Pep. They're similar for me. They're very similar, and they both want to play out ridiculously. You know. Fair play, brave, and with the ball, and you're going to need a goalkeeper if you take adopting that style of play. A rare can play, as Steve says, he can play. I do think you can get at him from set plays and putting the ball on him. I think he can. I think you saw the indecision yesterday. He's got to make that his. Even you know, either away, be dominant to the, to the centre back, or you know, the basic fundamentals there of defending. Um, and we didn't see it. And he must be under pressure playing as well. I think he, he must feel the pressure as well, Raya, you know, with Ramsdale there being a good pro, doing the right things. You see Ramsdale shouting at the, the referee yesterday, which was comical, um, you know, speed the game up. Um, and he's got the backing of the supporters, Ramsdale. So, again, it's that, that pressure you bring on yourself as a manager sometimes with the recruitment. And the recruitment is massive. And now, I mean, it's changed over the years massively um the managers now of course they, they still have a huge say on who comes in but the recruitment people are the ones that do the profiling now at the top level at most levels now will say to the manager you know um you know you're looking for a winger this is the type of winger he is he goes on the outside on the inside and the numbers are there 
And that going back to Havertz, the numbers should be there um, that you can look at as a manager to say, you know, the probability is he's going to get this amount of goals, this amount of assists. He might not, he might have stopped goals. But ultimately on, on the outfield, what I wanted to say is with all the profile and with everything that goes on and all the things that have changed in the modern game, there's three things still. Either you're scoring goals, making goals or stopping goals as a rule. And Steve will know what I mean by that. If you're not doing any of them, then you're just maybe easy on the eye or, you know, the team's carrying you in some way. So I think I think the recruitment's huge. Um, I think that's massive. I think Liverpool have got it, got it really right in their academy as well with the players that come through, you know, with someone like Alex Inglethorpe in, in charge there. That's, that's a brilliant resource for them. But the recruitment's everything. And I, I don't know how Arsenal will do it. I certainly know how Brentford do it and do a very good job of it and know exactly sort of the probability of what they're going to get. So um, if you pay money for players, you bring big players in, um, you know, you're going to come under pressure if you don't play them. All right. Um, I got a quick fire bit for you guys based on some bits that happened yesterday. Um, who was Whose mistake was it, Stevie? Saliba or Raya for the Liverpool goal right before half time? I think you, I think you got to put it down to Saliba. Yeah, yeah. I, I think in an ideal world, all the things Paul's talking about, you know, the the goalkeeper seeing that nobody's taking charge can help out. But I think I think initially the decision the decision Saliba's made to try and just hold off Diaz until the ball reaches the goalkeeper has been well. Again, we can see that it was the wrong decision because the balls ended up in the back of the net. So yeah. I think I think Saliba absolutely has a huge, huge part of the blame. If not if not all of it. You agree with that one, Paul? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean goalkeepers generally really annoy me anyway. So you know, um, <laughs> I just think yeah. I've been in this position before, right? I was a midfield player, I wasn't a defender. But when the ball goes in behind you, the keeper's either got to come and get it or leave some space for you to play it back to him. And I thought that Ray got caught in no man's land, which is why Saliba was trying to shadow it back to him. He would have been aware of where Raya was. And Raya ended up in no man's land. I mean, stay on your, on your line. Keep goal. If you're not going to come and get it, keep goal. And I'm now talking with the manager's head on. Because I've seen them balls over the top, where the goalkeeper, you know, the defender's going to get there first, like Saliba. Right, stay. Hold your ground. You know, but I think he, he, he got caught in no man's land. But at the end of the day, yeah, Bruce Lee, Saliba's just got to clear his lines. The minute there's that indecision and you're that close to goal, that's that's left foot away. Or even right foot, because there was no one else away, but left foot in that position away. Because um, in the end, it was a disaster. Rose Z moment. Stevie, would you say the same for Allison and Van Dyke? Is that as clear cut, their mix up? What happened there with two no. world class yeah. players? No, it's Van Dyke, hundred percent. You know, he he's made the decision. You know, I always have Ronnie Moran in my head. You know, Ronnie would have said, "Don't let the ball bounce." That's the first thing he would have said. But then once he's made the decision to let the ball go over his head and bounce, he obviously thinks it's going to run through far enough to 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 Allison. Uh, and then the way the way he's defending, the way he puts his body, the way he's holding Martinelli off, has got come and get come and clear this to Allison. The, the way he's gone about it is telling Alisson to come. Now, Alisson, when he's coming, sees all the signs and comes. Alisson can't do anything when Van Dijk ends up running into him. He can't he can't go round them. He's a, Van Dijk's a big lad. It's a long way round. And he's never going to get the ball. And Van Dijk isn't strong enough with Martinelli. The two of them collide. Martinelli manages to bump him a bit and he comes across into Allison's line and Allison ends up whiffing it. This is this for me is all down to the decision making of Van Dyke. He actually said after the game that it was his fault and he was absolutely mm. right. Shouldn't have let it bounce. And then when you do, you tell the goalkeeper basically with with your body to come and get it, and then you get in the goalie's way. Yeah, I'm afraid it's uh, Mr. Van Dyke's, unfortunately. Paul, um, 
a player who hasn't really lived up to the hype yet this season, his stats will tell you otherwise. Maybe his touches in the box um, are a little bit lower than last season. But has the star boy turned into a star man? We talk about great players, good players, who may not be as involved in the game but get a goal regardless. Uh, what's your take on Saka this season? Has he has he elevated? Has he progressed since last season for you? Well, I don't I don't know exactly what his his numbers are in goals and assists, but I mean I love Saka. I think I think you know he gives you everything every game. As a manager, you want to know that everything he's got every game. He's honest. He'll get back in. Um, you know, so I love him for them reasons. And I think he's an handful and I think he's developing, like I said earlier, in knowing when to go past his man, when to, to, to you know, pass it inside, making them good decisions at the right times in, in the And I think yesterday, you know, getting the goal um, is huge. I mean, it's huge. You want your big players to show up. He's, he's got the goal. He's finished it well um, in a good place there, you know, to follow in. So... I think he's a top top player, and I think there'll be a lot more, to, a lot more to come from him, which will be exciting for Arsenal and Arsenal fans. Um, with the running going to be so close now. Okay, so I thought it was seven and seven, but one of my squaddies um, corrected me: eight and seven, eight goals, seven assists. Stevie, when we spoke last season, you said to me in Super Kev, as long as those two boys are playing on either flanks, then. Not that nobody's got a chance, but Arsenal have every chance to be every single team if they're on top of their game. Um, Martinelli has not been great this season, but had his best game so far this season. You touched on him at the beginning, but I wanted to go back to him a little bit because you've been raving about Martinelli for a really, really long time. Mm. And I just wondered if Jorginho got the plaudits and player of the match. But he was the X factor. What was your take on Martinelli yesterday and how he damaged Liverpool in a way that many teams haven't been able to do that this season? Yeah. No, it's interesting. You talk about, you know, I guess the thing that more more than probably fans don't think about that we think about if, if we're actually playing or coaching or whatever is, is even when you're not at your best, if you can still be a threat, then that's that's the sign of a good player, and and I would say right now that's what that's what's happening with Saka. He's not hitting the heights he did last year, but as a defender, every second of every game, of every minute of every game, you wondering where this guy is, and you mm-hmm. you're keeping your eye on him, and 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 you're worried about him. I mean that's just, that that tells you how good a player is when every single player in the opposition is wondering where this guy is. And Martinelli's a little bit the same, you know. This year, I think his finishing probably has been off as opposed to last year. Mm-hmm. But I tell you what, he's a threat. I mean, defenders, first, the first thing you hate as a defender is anybody with pace. It's <laughs> the first thing. But then it makes it twice as bad when not only they have pace, but they've actually got a football brain. They're actually playing with their head up. Martinelli's not just a guy that just hits the ball past the defender and head down and run. You know, he's actually having a look. He's figuring out, do I keep going? Do I point, make the pass? Do I put the cross in? You know, so Martinelli for me has got every single tool that no fullback wants to play against. Now, it just happens to be easier for somebody with all of his abilities when you're playing against a guy who doesn't know a great deal about defending. And so... But you've still got to produce. You've still got to play well. You've still got to be a problem. And Martinelli was all of those things and, and, and more yesterday. Okay, so I'll get you both out on this. Um, in, fact, 50- in fact, actually, you can add in that not only was Martinelli taking the eye of, of Alexander-Arnold, but he was screwing up the whole Liverpool back line because Canati had to come over all the time. All the time, and yeah. take And take care of him as well. So Canati had two jobs to do. Because of Martinelli. And Havertz was bruising um, yesterday. Don't care how... I know some of you just don't see it, but Havertz caused problems. And, yeah, Liverpool were having to double down in some some places. And there were moments, like this picture I showed for a reason. He's got three players around him. There's a fourth one um, as well on the other side. And this was 
a joy for Arsenal fans because we hadn't seen this a lot this season. And he ended up playing his best football against the best team in England currently. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it was uh, definitely a great performance from him. Where does this all end, Paul? Going to get you guys out on this. Over 200 of you in live chat. You know what to do. Hit the like button. Um, and, you know, Kev's not here, but the same rules apply, uh, kids. Okay, now we're not going to give Stevie a headache here. Well, we might. We'll bring Vinny out. Um, smash those like. Vespa pulling off grandiose saves. Not playing like Grobelar, but she's not an annoying, annoying goalkeeper. <laughs> That's um, a good thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> like Paul says, Paul, where does this end for the Arsenal this season? You still have the juggernaut that is Manchester City. After a game like this, you start believing again. It's the hope that kills you. Do we have more chance of winning the Champions League than the Premier League? Are we going to win silverware? Does Mikel Arteta have to win it all to keep his job? Where does it all end? Well, I think Mikel's got to go for the title now. I mean, it, you can only go on looking at the league right now and what's happened yesterday because momentum's huge. Um, the Arsenal training ground will be buzzing. There's no two ways about that. Um, and if Martinelli and Saka can keep running at people and produce, you know, eight out of ten performances, Arsenal have a hell of a chance because... Go back to what Steve said there. If you've got, if you can make a Liverpool defence lopsided, and the way Arteta wants to play, and you've got them, them players now using their brains as well as their speed to come back checking the other side. I mean, you're going to get one v ones on the opposite side or two v ones, um, and that'll be too much. That'll be just too much for teams. And Martinelli is he'll run at you. He wants to run at you. He wants to take you on. Saka does as well. Um, so. I think if Arsenal, if Arsenal can play like that yesterday, I can see them winning the league. I can, I can see Arsenal winning it because I think Liverpool. Uh, you know, we spoke about with Jurgen Klopp and stuff. We don't know what's going to happen there. That's a that's a unique situation. Or well, certainly not not heard of it for for a number of years. What's going on there? And then you know, Man City have got to win the the games in hand. Stevie, um, I'm going to put a picture up right now. Found this one especially for you, except I didn't do it. It's Sky Sports that did this picture over Christmas, you know, before we hit the skids a little bit. You've got Klopp at the oh, window. Is that why it's <laughs> <laughs> You've got um, Pep, um, you know, by the window, Mikel sitting there. Uh, the narrative will change if we win it all. Stevie, Manchester City still a juggernaut. Some player called De Bruyne come back, destroying teams in 20 minute spells. What say you? How does this all end? Um, honestly, um, I can't. I can't believe I'm going to say it, but I, I, City's a team it beat. Say um, it, Stevie. I, I, I see City. I see. I see the finish of the season. The City won, Liverpool second, and Arsenal third. You know, I think. I think. Both Liverpool and City, they play the way they play, regardless. Arsenal haven't quite as great a win as it is uh, yesterday, as, and, and as important and bigger win as it is. They still haven't quite cracked how they win when teams are sitting tight. You know, they haven't. The other two, as I said, they play the way they play, and everybody else has to adjust. I think that's, well, Liverpool, that, Liverpool that, didn't that. play the way they play yesterday. No, no, but but that's because going forward they were poor, because they, a they were poor individually and as a unit, and b Arsenal were organised and and defended well and 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 won the battles and won the challenges. That's you know my point is Arsenal Arsenal play a different way depending on who they're playing against. Is as is, is the point Liverpool and and City. Try and go forward, regardless. They're, they're pushing the game. You know, Arsenal didn't go toe to toe with Liverpool because they know that if it's open, the Liverpool could cut them up, mm. and 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 they followed the basically the same game plan they had at Anfield when you when you drew one one, except you were a little deeper. But because you were at home, you weren't as deep. You were a lot a lot higher up the field, which made it easier for you to 
to, to get near an Allison. Um, but that would be my worry with Arsenal. You know, yes, they won a huge game. Yes, they deserve to win it. But they haven't quite... They haven't quite got that thing about them where regardless of who they're playing, the opposition's thinking, oh, we've got Arsenal's coming this weekend. You know, everybody's looking at Liverpool and City going, oh, no, we've got Liverpool and City coming. I don't think teams are looking at Arsenal quite like that. Teams know that they can do to Arsenal what Arsenal did to Liverpool and get something. Because that's what happened during that spell at Christmas. Teams just sat tight and then broke on them. So that's, that's why I think Arsenal will be third. But I just think City's City's better than everybody else. At the best, when they're all at the best, it's it's one, two, three, City, Liverpool and Arsenal. Yeah. There's a I would say last season we definitely had a little bit of an intimidation and fear factor back. I think that after this game against Liverpool, we'll probably earn some of that back. Uh, but also there's something to be said about not quite knowing what to expect from a team. And maybe that's going to be the Arsenal a little bit this season. Are they going to play you with speed? Are they going to play possession based? Are they going to mix it up in the game? Are they going to are they going to pack the midfield? Um, maybe Mikel Arteta has figured out a little bit of a plan B and how to play this league going forward and stop losing to teams like West Ham and Fulham. And yeah, maybe you might just win the league. It's not just about beating City for us. It's about not losing to those teams. Sophie, you were so positive there, and then all of a sudden you threw in losing to West Ham and Bournemouth and all these teams. Well, you, you actually sold it to me, and then all of a did sudden, did I? The, you, yeah. you fired the brake on all of a sudden from nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you know what, I'll get a ton of notes from people saying you're delusional. I'm not delusional. I'm just saying you you clear up those mental messes, right? as Arsenal Football Club, because the talent is there. This team has got the talent to win it all. But is our mentality going to allow us to do that? And not so long ago, Jurgen Klopp called his team mentality monsters. They shifted gears. They started to win. They're in finals. They get a step closer. This is the season for the Arsenal to do that. Take your process and progress to success. And let's start winning some shit. You guys rocked it. Thanks for joining me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Good stuff from the two of you. You can see Stevie on your screens on ESPN FC. Um, He doesn't like to be on the social media these days. So um, he's he's abandoned X. He abandoned it when it was Twitter. Hasn't even been on X, really. You can can find Paul at... Full of numpties. Full of (laughs) numpties. (laughs) <laughs> and with me off it, one less numpty. <laughs> Do you think you'll ever come back, Stevie? Not a chance. No? I start, I started arguing with everybody. Honestly, I'm like, I used, my son used to call me up. He'd be like, what are you doing? Because he'd be checking it. He'd be like, what are you doing? Get Take that down. You can't say that. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, ah, oh, ah. <laughs> yeah, for my own safety, I took it down. <laughs> You're actually getting in trouble with your own son, let alone um, uh, opposing well, fans and supporters. Brilliant stuff. Uh, you can follow Paul on Instagram at buckle underscore Paul. Paul, thanks again for joining. Absolutely smashed it. You're welcome. Thanks, Sophie. Cheers, Steve. Great to see you. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Cheers. And thanks. squaddies, um, don't forget to hit the like button on the way out. Um you remember, this is free content. You've got two absolute legends here um, giving you football intel. We'll be back with another live show on Wednesday. Stay tuned to find out exactly what that is. And as Super Kev would say, don't forget to tell your loved ones you love them. All right? At ease, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. <laughs>